One way of looking at the debt ceiling deal the House approved yesterday, which the Senate is expected to vote on as early as tonight, is that one of the biggest possible threats, both an economic threat to the country and a political threat to the Biden presidency, is about to be removed. The process that got us there was maddening and totally unnecessary. Right now, we have an economy that appears to be showing incredible resilience. Inflation coming down, the worst of a possible banking crisis, apparently and hopefully behind us. Although we'll know more after the May jobs report tomorrow, the latest numbers showed unemployment tied for the lowest rate in decades, with wages and benefits up, crucially. The last thing the country needed was a self-induced black swan event where we defaulted for the first time in American history. Now looks like that's not going to happen, which is an enormous deal from the perspective of the Biden administration's chief goal to get an economy that is working on all cylinders as we come out of a devastating global pandemic. Ron Klain served as the White House Chief of Staff during the first two years of the Biden administration as it fought to dig us out from the effects of COVID, and he joins me now. Ron, it's great to have you. Um, it's great to be here, Chris. Thanks. What were you thinking as someone who spent a lot of time uh, in that White House and worked with uh, the Senate and the House when you weren't doing kind of opposition party negotiations about how this deal came together? Well, I think, uh, look, I think, as you said, uh, the hostage, which was the U.S. economy, was spared. And I think that's a win for the American people. I think that, um, you know, there was no way to do this without getting the House to pass it. There was no way to get it on the floor of the House without the Speaker being willing to put it on the floor. And so they ha there had to be concessions to him. And that's just the result of the 2022 elections. But, you know, as you said, we have the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years in this country, the lowest black unemployment rate in the history of this country. Uh, you know, people at the bottom starting to make a little more money, starting to close the gap between prices and their wages, starting to see inflation come down. Price of gas is down more than a dollar from a year ago. So, you know, the economy is gaining traction. We're seeing growth. There's been talk about recession for months. You turn on CNBC, all you hear about is people predicting recessions. If the economy is not in a recession, we have a very strong jobs market up and down the scale. And a lot of people have been left behind before. And the last thing we needed was to blow that all up with a default that would throw markets into turmoil and would cost experts say at least a million jobs in the first two weeks of the default. And so sparing those people their jobs, sparing the economy, that's good for the country as a whole. There, there's some interesting sort of um, color on this that um, about the, the, the approach here, a few things. One, that Mitch McConnell uh, advised to get shrink the room, that it should just basically be Biden and McCarthy. And also, the White House officials sought to downplay what they privately considered to be a substantial victory. A headline from Politico, Just Don't Boast, how Biden World sought to ace the debt ceiling standoff. It is interesting to me that this president, a lot, there's a lot of times where people will, will urge this president to use the bully pulpit, where, and he doesn't use it in a way that strikes me as a strategic choice, whether it's the correct choice or not. What do you think? You know, I think there's a difference between not using the bully pulpit, pulpit and gloating about a deal. Uh, the president did, I think, speak quite forcefully about the need. If you're serious about reducing the deficit, serious about reducing the debt, we need to really work on revenues. And he talked about that repeatedly in the spring and early summer this year, about his plans to repeal some of the Trump tax cuts for the richest people in the country, about his plan to uh, have a tax on billionaires. And the Republicans made it very clear they were not going to go for any taxes. They were going to protect billionaires at all costs. And so he couldn't get that done in any kind of a negotiation with House Republicans. And I think he was forceful on that, but they just wouldn't go there. Just like the president wouldn't, no matter what McCarthy said, the president wouldn't cut Social Security, the president wouldn't cut Medicare, wouldn't cut Medicaid. The president wasn't going to uh, give up his student loan relief plan. And so, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that each side had some red lines. Uh, the Republicans wouldn't move off their red lines. The president didn't move off his red lines. As a result, we got a deal that, um, you know, it, it basically... Uh, avoids the default uh, and doesn't do that much harm to our economic growth. If I'm in the White House right now uh, on the domestic policy front, not on the international policy, the domestic yeah. policy front, the, the, the thing that I'm looking at uh, uh, from a political and substantive perspective, because the, the, I think the, the incentives are aligned, right? <laughs> What's good for the country yeah. will be good for the president politically. Yeah, I agree um, with that. Is the, the economy, right? And, and it, I'm just curious how you think this through, because if you're sitting in that white, it's like you can't really control whether the Fed hikes rates. 
You can't really, yeah. like, what you could do, you've done, right? You've avoided some big catastrophe or the debt ceiling deal. You've done all the fiscal stimulus, the ARP. You've done all these. Now you just got to sit there and hope we get a soft landing, basically, which is going to decide the fate of both millions of Americans and the, pr the president's political fate. What do you think? I don't agree, Chris. It's not just sitting and watching. The president passed major legislation in 2022. What they have to do this year is, is start to is implement it. So we got we passed the point. infrastructure yeah. bill. 7,000 projects started last year. There are more than 20,000 projects starting this year. It's a good that point. will create jobs and long-term economic growth. The Chips and Science Act, which is creating manufacturing jobs that provide six-figure incomes to people, even if they don't have a four-year college degree. It's going to change this country. It's going to make us lose our dependence on foreign chips and take control of our own supply of these critical aspects of, of modern manufacturing and our high-tech economy, and create a lot of great jobs. So, the, you know, they've got to get all these things going this year, and those things will have impact on the economy and will, uh, you know, make the president's legacy, president's achievements concrete to people. They know he passed some bills, but they don't really know what they mean or what they'll do for them. And this year is the year where you're going to start to see these things happen, and it will become much more concrete to people. Hmm. And already we're seeing the results of the Inflation Reduction Act with a massive expansion of solar projects, wind projects, the construction of electric battery, vehicle, bat, battery factories in the country, all over the country. We're, we are moving ahead dramatically on the creation of solar and wind and renewable power and on the uh, advancement of the U.S. as a leader in electric vehicles. Um, final question. I've asked you this before. The president today, we have a, a speech, with, I believe it was at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Um, he tripped. You may have seen the footage uh, literally over a sandbag that was somehow placed behind him, literally sandbagged. Um, it, it seemed to me, honestly, the kind of thing that would happen to anyone in that situation. But of course, you've already got people talking about the president's age, concerns about his age. I know that you've worked with him. The, his age is immutable, which is what makes it such a convenient yeah. attack, I think, for people that don't want to be president because, like, there's no rebutting it. But what do you say to people who are concerned? I say look at the results that this president is producing. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is a climate change bill. It's the most significant one passed on planet Earth. We were unable to do anything on climate change for decades in this country, and now we've passed this legislation. Look at the results he's produced in terms of low unemployment and bringing inflation down, getting us past the pandemic getting businesses back open, getting schools back to open. The measure of this president is the results he produces every single day, and avoiding this dangerous default was the, was the latest of those results. So you can judge the president by the results he's producing as president. I can tell you he is mentally sharp. He is physically fit. Uh, he, you know, obviously they had put sandbags on the stage to hold things down because it was windy, and he tripped over those sandbags as he was jogging across the stage to greet some guests after he'd stood for hours and shook hands and saluted every single graduate of the Air Force Academy. He is robust. He's robust mentally. He's robust physically. And uh, what happened to him today could have happened to anyone who was up there moving across that stage. I should note he also pardoned uh, any of the disciplinary infractions from that class as well, which uh, I think some were pretty happy about. Ron Klain, thank you very much for your time tonight.